That's a terrible joke, by the way. I apologize. <laughs> So um, it's with a huge amount of pleasure that um, I'm able to introduce David Burns um, talking about adding gestures to WebDriver uh, on mobile. Um, it's going to be fantastic. David, if you don't know, is one of the core contributors on Selenium. Um, and he's always got fascinating and interesting things to say. So please, welcome him to uh, SeleniumCon. Um, so I should be doing my talk with um, a colleague, Malini. Um, unfortunately, she had to go home yesterday. She wasn't feeling uh, brilliant. So um, hopefully we can, I'll get through this. So I apologize if I kind of talk a bit quickly in certain parts. They weren't my slides to start with. So I'm going to kind of just go through everything. Um, so I work on the automation and tools team in, uh, in Mozilla. We like to call ourselves the A-team, and we kind of do all these really nifty things whenever the trouble comes up. Um, and one of the things, one of those troubly things that came up uh, rec well, recently, uh, 18 months ago, was platform developers decided that they were going to put Firefox on a mobile device. And we thought, wow, this is great. We're going to carry on and have some fun. Um, but then we were thinking, well, we need to kind of test this. And when you kind of think about testing in um, Mozilla, you kind of think of millions of tests running on a huge grid, uh, multiple platforms, things like that. And then we have to now do, on top of doing Android, which, to be honest, Android testing has been painful for us, we now need to kind of expand this into this new world. And we, we've never really been there, like because testing operating systems is an interesting thing, because there's different things. And one of the really cool things that came out of it is how do we actually handle gestures? How do we do things like that? So I'm hopefully going to walk through it. Um, I have a couple demos, so hopefully I might wow a few of you and kind of show you Firefox OS uh, in, in it as well. So as we all know, um, mobile is the future. And it's awesome. We've got, we've got all these really cool tools. Um, a number of people in the audience have their iPads or their Android tablets or their Android phones and things like that. So mobile is definitely the future. Um, but unfortunately, it's kind of very, very sad times when it comes to automators. Because we've got all these really cool tools and for desktop. You know, if you want to look at something on your desktop, if you open up Firefox, you can use the inspector that's built into Firefox. Or you can use Firebug. You can do all these really nice things. Doing that on mobile, not so much. Uh, so you kind of like have to know the source code. You have to do things. Uh, as Francois pointed out, you kind of, if you're doing automation, you kind of need to actually see what the, the application is doing, how the application is held together. Uh, and you've got all these nice things together. And when you're an automator, you kind of go, I just want to do this. And now I need to do all these steps just to get to there, where on desktop, it's not so much. Um, so we've got this kind of sad times ahead. But hopefully, it's not going to be that sad, because you know, um, we're moving into the world that is mobile. Um, but one of the key differences for mobile is touch screens. And it's not just for mobile. Like uh, Google have proved it with their new Prism device, which is a laptop uh, with, you know, proper keyboard built in with a touch screen. And that's kind of the future. You know? Touch is the way we need to go forward. We need to think about how we handle it. Um, and we need to kind of think about all the problems that come up with it. Um, and well, to be honest, on mobile and touch devices, a click is not really a click. So if you kind of know how browser events happen, um, in the current world as we live, it's a, it will do touch events. So it'll be like a touch start, touch move, touch up. And then it replicates all those with mouse events and then finishes. Like if so, if you do a click, the last thing it would do is a click. Um, so it's kind of, it's not this really um, normal world that we're used to. And we're also moving into a very interesting world with kind of the new toys that are coming out of Microsoft. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Microsoft Surface tables, which have got all these really cool things. And 
uh, examples that they've shown is that you can put a device on and it can start transferring onto the screen and you can move things about. And it's really, really cool. It's like really exciting. You know, this is a brave new world we're going to. Um, using Simon's Star Trek joke, you, we are moving towards that world where everything's just touch, you know. You're not going to have this tactile response from things anymore, like as we slowly move into it. Um, but now if you start thinking of a device like that, and you think about how you're going to automate it, how many people could use a touch, a, a surface table at the same time? And you might actually want to automate that. Like, so uh, if you're a nerd like me, and you kind of like uh, Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. And if you start thinking about how you could play that on a surface table where you've got all these different things and you're moving it around, you could have four to 10 people playing at the same time. And now we need to automate problems like that. This is kind of the thought process we were going through when we were thinking about how we're gonna handle gestures in the future. Because we wanted to try to come up with a solution that was future-proof. Um, so I'm just gonna start working through all of them and hopefully show you examples along the way. So we know that a single finger gesture is what we do every day. You know, if you on your phone, you want to just tap something, you tap it, you want to swipe, so you scroll or you unlock your phone, you can do all these things. And it's really, really um, simple. Um, and like uh, the WebDriver API has action chains for touch. So if you have, say, an Android device and you want to unlock it and you've got, you've got to draw a pattern, you can easily do that. You just put your finger down and then draw it out and it can work. And it's great. Um, so we know that the problems come up and we've, like, WebDrive has solved it for the single touch. And it's, um, we've got all these, um, things that are there, and we've, we know that automating it is just an API, you handle it, and it carries on. Um, and we know this from the advanced user interactions, and like I was saying, you just kind of press, you, you can actually design it nicely, and you can do what you want, and you can draw really nice things. And this is a, like, and it's kind of what we've been doing uh, for desktop for a while, so if you want to do hovers, you kind of make the mouse over something, you move it by offsets, things like that, and you can handle it. And this is an example. So, you know, we want to do multiple clicks while holding a key down. So for those who have not actually used advanced in interactions, this is kind of what it would look like in Java. Um, and you can kind of just build this and then perform it. Um, and it's really, like, this is how people have been using web, web applications for a while, and this is why Google has um, built this API, and they, I think they did a really good job of it. Um, and for desktop, it works brilliantly. Um, and we've kind of done the same for touch. You know, there's certain things that are different. So, as I said earlier, a click is not really a click. Um, we need to be able to handle these things. And we need to handle touch events, like taps, um, swipes, double taps, things like that. Like um, for, those, for a lot of apps nowadays, if you want to, say, using Flickr and you want to like an image, you just double tap it, it likes the image, and you can carry on. Um, and we can do this easily with the, the chains. Um, So we've got all these basic primitives. Um, one of the, the key things that we've been doing differently to the current web driver approach is we, we handle all the primitives. So you're know, pressing, moving, move by offset, releasing. Um, we've created a new one um, called wait, because you might need to press and hold for a while on something. Um, and it's, it's kind of useful. Um, but we then take all of that and we batch it up in one useful um, example. 
and we send that across the wire so that we can handle it uh, on the device because the way WebDriver is designed is that you've got your local end, which could be your Python bindings, your Ruby bindings, your .NET or Java. Uh, we, we then pass that across to the device, and then we kind of unwind it on the device. Um, the reason why we started doing this is uh, the way our server farm handles things um, meant that we, like, we would send stuff across, and the latency between calls would, was killing us. Like, you know, um, sometimes there could be a, a second delay from you doing one action to doing the next action. And this is really not useful, especially if you're trying to do a double tap, and you do a double tap, and it's tap, tap, because then it just applications kind of think of it as just one single tap. Um, so we needed to solve this and solve this in a useful way. Um, and we, but one thing we did make sure is that you could still do a tap away from actions, so that you can. It's not part of the gesture chains that I'm discussing today, but you could still kind of. It's attached to web element. You can tap it and. Uh, access it as you want. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick demo of Marionette. Uh, so for those who don't know, Marionette's the code name that we use in Mozilla for what we like to call WebDriver++. It's WebDriver, but it's got a number of specific hooks for for the way we, we need things. So we can access different parts of the application. And hopefully tomorrow, uh, Jonathan and I will be discussing more, more in depth about that. So this, is, this demo, we're just going to kind of show how we handle um, scrolling. Can everyone see the mobile device all right? Um, I can always zoom in a bit better if you need. Um, Oh, no. And what the, oh, sorry, hold me one second. Oh, sorry. So this is us using the, the action chains to kind of scroll. Can everyone see that? I can do it again if need be. Oh. Let's do it again. So, um, and th this is kind of, this allows us, to, so what we've done is that we've got a helper class that allows us to kind of scroll to a certain point in the page and then go, OK, and then scroll back up. Um, this is kind of useful for those people who build single page apps, uh, especially on mobile and things like that, because you might want it to go all the way to the bottom, and then it, like the Ajax might start pulling out in new parts. Um, and it's, you know, like a, I really think it's awesome that we can, a simple API can just move things around and kind of give us this feel that a user would be, how they would use it and how they would handle it. Um, and this is kind of one of the key driving points of WebDriver is that WebDriver must be able to try emulate a user as much as possible. And now we've, we've hopefully got it. Oop. Okay. And so single finger is fine, because that's how most people use it. Um, but we needed to think of ways that how people use their, their, um, their devices in different ways. Um, and 
multi-finger is now becoming kind of the way to do things. If you want to play games on, say, iPads and things like that, um, a lot of the times you'll, they will emulate a, um, the buttons on the, in the game. So you will have buttons on one side, and you will have a like, trackpad type thing on the other side, so you can move about and handle it. Um, so we were thinking, wow, this is great. Um, a number of people on my team like to play games quite a lot. So they were like, well, whatever we do, we need to make sure that we can handle pinch zoom, as an example, because people do that a lot. You know, they have a web page. If you're like me and fairly blind, um, you can kind of you make the text really, really big, and it's great. But the people on my team also wanted to make sure that we could kind of, if there's a HTML5 version of GarageBand, um, so you, you want to play guitar or whatever, you need to be able to handle this nicely. The API needs to be succinct, it needs to be beautiful, and handle it. And we need to make sure that whatever I do on this hand or this finger can be done independent of this finger. And that was kind of our driving force of this. Um, and we need to do this and make it kind of scalable. So a lot of the time, we needed to think about how um, I was saying about the surface table. If we've got five people handling it, and we want to, say, potentially automate five people doing this, I'm not saying you would do that, but we kind of need to make it scalable. Uh, and ideally, we wanted to make it future-proof. Um, OK, so that's kind of what I've just said was the considerations. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of handling all these simultaneous actions at the same time. Um, and so what we've done is we've created a, uh, a new type of object called a multi-action chain, which allows you to build your single finger actions like you normally would, um, and then pass these over to the multi-actions. And then the multi-actions will then do the actions for you, and we'll do them in certain orders and things like that. So you just kind of build it up as you want. If you want to drag things around, um, kind of think of pressing your finger on one point on the screen and then moving it in an arc. If you want to say Google Maps, you want to move your, your points of view around, you can do that. But when you're doing things like that, we need to think of a way that you can synchronize actions. Because you want to be able to, even though you might say this, this hand and this hand want to be handling things in a uh, kind of independently, you want to be able to synchronize them. Because you might think of, say, playing Garage Band, and you know that things are going to happen at a certain beat, at a certain rhythm. You can kind of tap things on one finger, um, but you want to tapping at a different in, a, say, the opposite order on another finger. And we needed to kind of handle these. Um, and to be honest, this is one of the kind of the hardest problems that we were, we were facing with it, is how could we build all of this, still batch it up, send it across the wire to the device, or, um, because we, we're using it that way to remove latency, do it that way, and then get information um, like, if once it's done, it, we can kind of then interrogate the device and see how things are going. OK. So we would do the, the first action. Um, so uh, for a zoom out, we kind of need a finger to start. Like, if we have two fingers, start here and move away. Then we build another finger, and we do it, and we do it in the opposite direction. Uh, and then we pass it over to this multi-action. So we just kind of add these actions together. And then um, instead of, like the one thing you'll notice in the actions is that we're not telling it to perform the actions. Because if the minute you send, say perform, uh, it kind of gets sent across the wire. And then it will do all the actions. So we don't send the perform. And we add that, that's been added to the multi-actions. And that will kind of tell the device that we have this group of data, and we've sent it across, and we need to perform on them. 
So when we're executing, um, we kind of split things off. So um, I'm sorry if people can't see this. Um, if you can kind of just make sure you can see the, the blue line, uh, two blue lines, that's kind of the most important bit. Each of those blue lines is an action, action chain. And um, so whenever we kind of, say, have a tick, the tick will do those, it will break them up into certain parts. So if your action chain is three items, it will kind of do it in, say, three ticks. So that will be, tick one will be like, press down. And if you've got multi-actions, it'll be press down with this finger. And if you need to press down with this finger at the same time, press down. So it's handled. Then the next, action, next part of the chain will be executed, which is the next red line and then the final action, and then you can kind of see what you want. And you can kind of chain as much as you want. So this is really nice if you make sure that your chains are the exact same length. But unfortunately, real life doesn't actually work that way. We need to find new ways, like people want to be doing different things. They, certain fingers, might, you might just hold, hold the item down for a while and move the other things around it. And you need to, we need to kind of handle things like that. Um, so, yeah, we have fingers that might be inactive at the same time, and we need to handle this, and we need to handle this gracefully, because designing an API is very hard, and designing it in a way that won't be abused and, won't, and will be nicely handled is always kind of the key part of designing an API. So we needed to know all of these problems, uh, like figure out these problems before we carried on. So, um, so we have like two action chains here. Um, we have one that will, like I say earlier, press, and then we're going to have another one that's going to drag an item around it. Um, so the first it first action chain's only got three items, and it's kind of doing the dragging. The next item's got a uh, a press on a, a different element. And it's got a weight. And now, um, kind of the interesting thing of a, a weight with nothing passed in is that it allows us to handle, uh, it, we handle it in a kind of a, a no-op situation. So we don't do any operations at that time. And then we've got a wait again, where we're going to wait um, five seconds, so 5,000 milliseconds. And then we're going to release. So the The action chain kind of, if you're looking at it at a visual point of view, kind of looks like that. So one chain's longer than the other, and then when we execute it, um, they will kind of, each red line, which is a tick, they will handle that, that group of actions, that group, that group, and then one will finish, but the other one needs to just carry on. And once that's all done, then we re return um, back to the client code and go, all your actions are now being executed. Please carry on with your next item. Um, so I will now show an example. And what this example is going to do is going to um, just show a, a, a pinch zoom. So it selected an item and then kind of zoomed in there. Um, it's not obvious when you're seeing it, but it is actually doing a pinch zoom because the picture is bigger than it should be uh, in this situation. Um, but it means that now we can kind of do pinch zoom, and these are kind of fundamental things that people want to be doing on their devices. Um, so that's it. OK. Um, part of the problem, the challenges that we've been handling with all of this is Mozilla is very keen on handling W3C specifications. 
Everything that, hand, that goes through the browser ideally should be uh, in a spec, in a specification. It must be kind of being spoke about in the open, because that's the Mozilla way. We, w we don't want to be hiding things. Um, but the problem we ha we've kind of been having while we've been working on this is that a lot of specifications are in flux. So uh, there's a touch events specification, which is, uh, was built by um, Mozilla and someone from Apple. Unfortunately, due to uh, a few royalties issues, um, it's kind of it's a specification that's kind of dead in the water. We, not a lot of companies want to handle it, um, specifically Microsoft. And if Microsoft don't, like Microsoft don't want to pay uh, royalties on it because um, the touch events have patents on them, which means you kind of have to pay royalties. And they've, um, they created a new specification and they've put it forward as a straw man. Um, it's not far from being, um, handled properly by browsers, um, and that's called pointer events. But the way pointer events and the way touch events work are two different things. So like, as I said earlier, the touch events, it will handle all the touch events, then it will duplicate them in um, mouse events and carry on. With pointer events, it does it kind of, they will handle a touch, then a mouse, then a touch, then a mouse, touch and a mouse. And from an automation point of view, from let's say Mozilla and Chrome and anyone else who implements it, it creates a lot of interesting time for automators uh, or for say the WebDriver project or for Chrome or for Mozilla to handle these things. Um, and there's also missing implementations for, all of, for the different specs. So if we propose anything, it's, it's going to be fairly interesting. Um, So where to next? Mozilla is going to be proposing this spec um, all of this that we've been doing to the W3C web driver specification. Um, I expect there will be a lot of pushback on certain items. And that's perfectly right, because we need to solve these problems. Um, but it means that we have something that kind of allows us to at Mozilla to move forward and hopefully kind of put something out there that's carries on the Mozilla spirit of everything needs to be open, everything needs to be specified, and carry on. Um, and that's it, really. Um, hopefully, you have some interesting questions and found that useful. And I will um, hopefully answer all of them. Thank you. Um, so the question was, every time there's a red line, would it, would it move to the next group after the first set? So it handles, so like so if you've got, say, three action chains together, um, and it will handle the, f it will return after all the first actions have, ha have happened. So all those, in a, like it kind of splits them all down a line. Once all of those are finished, then it moves on to the next one, and then so on. At the moment, yes. Um, like, as, uh, at the moment, this is just kind of a proposal that we've been doing, and we, we appreciate a lot of it's not going to be ideal, and we need to solve those problems. At the moment, I believe, yes, it will wait, and then carry on to the next thing. Um, it's something that we need to solve, but it's not, some, not a problem we've hit yet, so. The, I guess you could split it into multiple ways. Yeah. It, and, there's probably other ways around it, but we need to, for a lot of the things that, th this kind of solves the 80%, and uh, we need to kind of solve the other 20%, and we'll get there. And this is kind of where I'm hoping w when we go to the W3C, because there's other implementers, or hopefully there'll be other implementers, we can kind of thrash it out and kind of two heads are better than one type of thing. Yep. Um, yeah, you can. That, that's kind of one of the reasons why it's there. It's just to, if you wanted to kind of make sure that it, the chain's finished at the same time. 
so the, the question was why is that why we have a weight with no no action in it? It is just to make sure that if you wanted a mechanism to do that, you have it. Um, I appreciate it's not very pretty. It's not pretty at all, but it kind of serves a purpose at the moment. Are there any other questions? No? Oh, yeah? Um, so the question is, can it be, could we use it to say, use it on connect or leap motion and things like that? I don't think so at the moment, because the, um, one of the things that is missing uh, that we haven't implemented, mainly because it's not in Firefox, is um, in pointer events, um, you can also put, like, it's more than just say touch, it's if you have a pen and things like that. That's why the points of events um, spec is kind of slightly, not slightly, it's a lot more superior than the touch events, is that you can handle um, pens and things like that. But you can also handle, you can, you're supposed to be able to handle the pen at a certain angle and things like that. So if you're saying drawing something, and you move it at a different angle, it means you can kind of do different brush strokes and things like that. Um, so I don't think it can handle that. At the moment, because you, because now we, when for those types of problems, you're starting to move into a 3D space, and you need to be able to handle that. And I don't think it ha would handle that at the moment. But I don't. With a bit of work and like discussion and things like that, I can't see it being tweaked. Like it could be tweaked to handle that eventually. But it's it's not. Yeah, like let us solve this one problem. Because every time we solve one problem, we have enough knowledge to solve the next problem. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs>